Hello, everybody, and welcome. Welcome to Friday Live with me, Matthew Dashper Hughes. This week, it is my absolute pleasure to be joined by Carol Hicks. And Carol is a friend of mine. She's a client of mine. She's also the author of the Resilience Template Seven Steps for um, Improving Your Mental Health, which is hence the uh, title of today's live stream, which is exactly that. Um, so, without further ado, let's uh, welcome Carol. Carol, hi, how are you doing? Good to see you. Hi, thank you ever so much for interviewing me. I, I'm doing great, apart from the COVID jab this morning. <laughs> okay, well, well, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. You don't have any um, adverse reactions. Uh, I know. I know a couple of people have uh, found it's knocked them about a little bit for 24 hours, but then they're back fighting strong, and of course, um, you know, ho hopefully protected as well, which is what it's all about. So, uh, good stuff. Well, um, Carol. Firstly, welcome. Fantastic to have you with us. Um, t tell us uh, in sort of 60 to 90 seconds, just a quick overview of who you are, what it is you do, what's your background and how you add value to your clients. OK, um, I'm a multidisciplined therapist, which means that I just can't list all of them because it's too long. Um, I suppose initially people would think of me as a clinical hypnotherapist, emotional freedom technique practitioner, life coach, mindfulness teacher. but Within that, there are several other modalities that I do. Um, how do I add value to my clients? I add value to my clients by not having walked their journey, but having walked my own particular journey. And somebody asked me how long it's taken me to write the book. And I said three years in the planning, seven months in the writing and um, a lifetime in the living and learning. And I think that's that sums things up. Um, I used to be a teacher before I became a therapist. and I did that very late in life too. I'm a late developer. Um, and so before that, I was um, 20 years in pastoral roles in education. So I've always had an interest in working with people. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that. So um, I suppose you, you just hinted a little bit about, uh, I guess, probably the answer to my first question, which is really, you know, what, what's what's the route that's led you here? I mean, I know you've you've described it to me previously as having, you know, three real routes to to, to the reason you do what it is that you do now. Um, would you mind sharing just in a high level overview um, what your journey's been like? Yeah. Um, so there are th there are three drivers. So the first driver hit me when I was fifty, actually. And I didn't realise that that the impact of childhood trauma can actually have a, uh, this. I was very naive, can have a long lasting effect on your life. So there's a questionnaire called the ACE questionnaire. And the premise is it asks you 10 questions about childhood up to the age of 18. And if you score six or over, then potentially you have run more risk later in life of having um health problems and potentially you could die 20 years ahead of your peers that's my first driver because I think this is stuff that we all need to know and the next one is that I've got five prolapse discs I've got a diagnosis of dystonia that I'm paralyzing down the left side of the body and so chronic pain was a massive issue for me and when I retrained as a therapist I don't have the pain anymore I have the discs I have the issues, but I don't have the pain um, because I dealt with mindset. And then the, the fourth one, which happened at a similar time to the pain, was four years of chronic insomnia and it's world sleep day today. Um, at the end of my four years, the last six months, I was getting about 56 minutes a night. The brain can be that accurate. Um, so you can imagine it was, uh, they were very hard times. Wow. And uh, there were a few more catalysts that year, which I won't go into. Um, but basically, the the universe got a big hammer out, hit me over the head, Christmas 2016, and said, sort your stuff out. And I did. And I became a therapist. Uh, absolutely. Wow. And um, I think when you've got the, those sort of personal elements to this kind of journey, you know, when you do go into the area that you're into and you, and you, and you add the academic rigour, um, that sort of, I suppose, gives shape to the kind of journey that you've you've been on yourself. Um, it means that everything just has a, a degree more, I suppose, meaning and, and the empathy that you that you've got for other people. 
well, it's predicated on your own understanding and your own lived experience. So that makes it incredibly powerful. Um, I, the, you mentioned the ACE uh, question. Now, now, I didn't know anything about this until I read your book. I have to I, you know, confess my own ignorance. And, and you know, I, I went and found it online. Just, just um, for the benefit of uh, the people watching at home, what, what does ACE stand for? Adverse Childhood Experience. And it asks you the kind of questions, maybe, you know, did you grow up with somebody in your house who you saw hit, hit a parent or did you grow up in a household where there were alcohol or drug problems? Were you, you know, how, were you frightened as a child? Um, and I say the, the, the general rule is if you can score six or more out of ten, that potentially you, you're at risk later in life. Yeah, uh, it, it's it is it's a relatively simple, straightforward um, questionnaire to uh, to do, and it's self-diagnostic in that sense. And and I have to say, I did it myself, and and you know, I, I led a fairly kind of blessed and charmed life um, uh, over the course of the, of the sort of nearly forty-seven years I've been on the planet. So unsurprisingly, I, I didn't come out with, uh, with with the kind of same levels of trauma that that you certainly experienced. But um, it, it's um, it is certainly something that opened my eyes i guess that kind of uh, question and, and i suppose it also speaks to why it is that you've really built a lot of your work around helping you both yourself and your clients to build mental resilience um just if you wouldn't mind uh, just paint a picture for for us as, as to what you mean by resilience what, what does that word actually mean for you for me i think it's summed up in the book by um the song um i get knocked down but, but i get up again i think it's just <laughs> it's it's that it's that we you know life is hard it's not meant to be a disney film um it's also amazing um and we get knocked down and we get buffeted and we we have to withstand storms and we get up again um so resilience is all about how we do that and how we practice it and how we teach our children to do it as well yeah you know we can't yeah. protect our children from life I think, I think uh, and I have to say, I did have a wry smile when I got to that particular part because it's fairly early on in the book that bit uh, when when you suddenly start quoting Chumba Wumba. I'm thinking, <laughs> I, I didn't expect to be reading nineties lyrics, but there you go. That's <laughs> fine. You you you're clearly coming from my era there, so I'm <laughs> speaking to my happy place. I like that. <laughs> You do then go on and and, um, and talk about four pillars of resilience, if you like, and and you paint a fairly sort of um, robust picture of what those four pillars are. Um, just just give us a bit of an overview, if you don't mind, without, without any spoilers, because we want people to buy the book. <laughs> a free advert here, everybody, go buy this book. It's on Amazon. It's, it's it really is very very good. Whether you're living with the kinds of things that uh, Carol actually helps her clients with, or, or whether you're just interested in human psychology, it really is terrific. It's a great read. So um, uh, please set us what are the four pillars that you talk about well thanks for that Matthew the check is in the post um, <laughs> flexibility you know and um, we get knocked down but we get up again we've got to be flexible as a species we have to adapt and we see like the, we see nature in all the time you know we see as I mentioned in the book we see plants growing on building sites and things so flexibility you know we've got to adapt and, you know, I say to people a year ago, did you ever think that the first thing you'll say or the last thing you'll say as you're going out would be, let me get my mask? No, we've adapted. Um, and then the next one is pragmatism. You know, we've got to be realistic. You know, these are engines, they wear out. This is a, you know, life isn't always a bed of roses. So we've got to be realistic and we've got to plan. Um, I think there, you know, sometimes there are people who think that life just happens to them, but it doesn't. It's not personal. It's just life. So we we do have to plan, and that might be, you know, just as we plan how to run a business or we plan um, where we're going on holiday. We have to plan for our mental health. We have to plan for our resilience. Um, you don't put unleaded fuel in a diesel car. Um, you plan. And then the other one is action. And that takes me back to what I, I just said. We have to be people of action. We have to do something every single day. Um, nothing extraordinary happens in the ordinary. So we have to be people of action um, and we have to take responsibility. I, I really love the word responsibility. I don't know if you've thought about it. It means, uh, it, it means response able. Yeah. Are you able uh, to respond? 
I, I, I love it. Absolutely. And, and uh, uh, underpinning that, sort of holding ourselves accountable, which, which I suppose falls into the pragmatism piece as well. So you've got yeah. flexibility, um, adaptability, I suppose, rather than reactive. Yeah because um to react is to be instinctive whereas to respond is to actually do things in i suppose a planned way a measured way and all of those four pillars i thought really inter intermingled with each other and, and formed a, a really coherent whole uh, and i and I, so I, I, wrote, I wrote myself a little note when i was uh, when i was reading along with your book you can always tell a good book when you've got no, a notepad next to you right um so I, I i wrote down for me now based on what i'm reading here uh, to be resilient, the word resilient is a noun, but in order for you to actually experience resilience and to experience the benefits of resilience, you've got to live it like it's a verb. You've got to do it. Uh, yeah. and I think that was quite that was quite powerful. I mean, because I'm a, I'm a word guy, I like words. So, you know, hence I went that way with it. Um, but then you, you, you paint a picture of really a, a seven step model, hence the, um, the seven steps to improve your mental health. Uh, you paint you paint the picture of this seven step model. And, and I mean, in a beautiful kind of acronym, you actually make it into a word, which I thought was terribly clever as well. So the word is partner, which I thought was yeah. really nice. So, so just just give us a bit of an overview. What 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 do the steps of partner actually mean? Well, I mean, I think I make the first comment that we're partnership between our subconscious mind and our conscious mind, and we don't have enough hours in the day to go into that. But why we do need to get our subconscious mind on board. Um, but the partner steps are the steps that I used when I was doing this as a community class with people um, pre-lockdown. The first one is preparation. I think a lot of times we try and make ourselves feel better. But, in, but we try and make ourselves feel better without actually acknowledging that there's an actual problem. So preparation is about making sure that whatever is going on inside us is calm. Um, it's putting out the fire so that we can carry on and do the rest of the work. So preparation's absolutely vital. Acceptance. There's so many of us who've had stuff that have gone on in the past and we're using so much energy now fighting stuff that we can't change. So acceptance that things have happened. They have been unfair. They have felt terrible at times. But we accept that they happened and we accept that we can move forward i think it's really important um and then the next one is reconnect certainly with my back i gave up my power to doctors and consultants if i'd have listened to my body if i'd have stayed connected and when we're living in an anxious head we do tend to lose connection if i'd have stayed connected my life would have been so much easier. So reconnection is really, really important. Um, and then T4 talk, self-talk. Um, a lot of us have got an inner critic. A lot of us have got a voice that, you know, is always muttering in the background about how awful we are or how stupid we are. So looking at that self-talk and, and understanding that we don't do this to anybody else. We don't do this to anybody we, we love or like or admire. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a lack of respect. You know, we have to respect ourselves. We have to talk nicely to ourselves. Um, and that leads us into N is for now. And, you know, so many people don't have time to change things. Don't know so many people, they'll do it at the weekend. They'll, they'll do it at Lent. They'll do it when the children leave home. We're not guaranteed any any time other than now so i think now is absolutely vital and then embed and this for me is the special one this is this was my ka -ching moment when clients couldn't remember to do things or didn't know when the best time to do things were was because you know if we're dealing with an anxious mind there is some brain fog or there can be so the embed section for me is vital because we hang these new techniques and tools, which are going to become new habits. We've just got to give them time to embed um, and we hang them on existing habits. Everybody's got two minutes when they wash their hands, and they go to the low. Everybody can do a preparation technique to calm the um, fight or flight response. Everybody's got a, a minute when they're boiling a kettle. So there is no longer any, any excuse why people can't do these things. And then the final one's reflection. You know, some things will work, some things won't work. Why don't they work? Often it's because 
those are the things that we really need to do um, that we kind of push away because they're the hard they're the hard things reflection is really important reflection and what do i need to do now my life's changed i'm not the same person that i was so keep coming back to that idea that you know our destination is going to change a little bit and we need just to come back and just refocus so it they, actually that um that word partner came very easily um in the end and and i think I, I, it meant a lot to me being able to think about that partnership as i said between conscious and subconscious mind it, it's it's a it's, word it, it strikes me that that word is just so appropriate for what it is you're trying to get across the point that you're trying to get across um yeah. and, and i think you know the fact that it's the seven steps as well which is that perfect you know seven plus one minus two yeah. being the way that our short-term memories work and our brains work it's, it's just it just seems to be almost like it was meant to be i really like that for you. so yeah. A couple of things I'd like to pick up on and unpack a little bit because um, I'm conscious that those people watching might be, um, I suppose, wondering what some of what we're just talking about actually means. So we talked a little bit there about the fight or flight response and, and preparation and things. I mean, my, I remember my old psychology lecturer used to call the fight or flight response the quadruple F response, which was fight, flight, freeze or copulate, which if you think about it, it's quite rude. Um, <laughs> but really, it's... It, it, it speaks to the fact that actually this is a response to environmental cues and those environmental cues are called stressors. So basically stress or, or, or that physiological response to the environment is a perfectly natural part of who we are. In fact, without it, our species wouldn't have survived at all. It, it is yeah. it is literally a survival response and indeed a procreation response. So, you know, we wouldn't be here having this conversation uh, on this wonderful live streaming technology uh, if it wasn't for the fact that our ape-like ancestors had this response way back when, because they never would have survived to pass on their genes. Um, yeah. So, so it's, it's really our physiological response to the environmental cues, but then it's our, our mindset response that then is overlaid onto that. And I suppose reaction and response are, are two slightly different things. But preparation, you mentioned right at the very beginning of the partner model. I, I, I was put in mind of, have you ever read um, Lessons from the Hanoi Hilton, by the way? Have you ever read that book? It, no. It, great book, really is good, but put it on your reading list. It's it's. Okay. A little bit harrowing. I don't, I don't know why I'm saying it's a terrific book. It's not like it's it's a fun read to, in some ways, but it's it's, uh, it's about a guy called uh, James Stockdale. In fact, he's called James Bond Stockdale. His middle name is actually Bond, so he's literally James Bond. Um, and he was a guy who was shot down in the Vietnam War. He was he was an American pilot. He was shot down a, a, over over Saigon, and um, he was taken to this um, prisoner of war camp. Um, you know, euphemistically dubbed the Hanoi Hilton, and. Um, it was interesting because in the book he talks about how um, U.S. Air Force pilots during that war were, were or that conflict were, were trained to kind of overcome the amygdala hijack, the the, the fight or flight response. Okay. And he talks about um, how they would get, um, the, as in the U.S. Army, would get the this cockpit from a from a, um, a plane and they would suspend it over a um, a swimming pool like a deep diving swimming pool. And then they would, without warning, release the pilot, uh, cockpit and all, into the pool. And then the pilot would have to, you know, unshackle his harness and get out and, and basically extricate the, themselves from this kind of um, mock crash. And they would do it over and over and over again because rehearsal you can actually habituate your amygdala to uh, to to be able to deal with the uh, the, the environmental cues so the stressor is still there but habituation yeah. preparation is such a key part of that and, and and i was sort of put in mind of that when i was reading your book i didn't know if you'd actually come across that story or similar no, no. quite cool isn't it yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so t t talk to us a little bit about about sort of um, what preparation looks like in in your world, and maybe some of the stuff that you do with some of your clients. Obviously, without um, breaching any confidences. Preparation for me is about. So, I think of fight or flight as we, they've sent in the army. So, our brain has sent in the army. The defenses have gone up. So, Rich thinks this is corny, but for me, I send in the army. <laughs> Okay, so <laughs> I didn't mention that in the book. No, um, I'll be rich on that one. <laughs> I send in the car, me. Um, it's about, so 
it's about if your brain has gone through a series of it, it's reacted to a perceived threat so it triggers a set of responses in your body what we can do is we can use these techniques to override the message that they're all giving to the to the brain the, that the brain's giving to the body by changing our body responses we're now overriding the fight or flight response so in the preparation what i do is i do techniques which manually override a brain that's gone into the stress response so stress brain will be really really focused you know if you've seen anybody who's scared at driving the clutching on it so we'll use eye movement mm. as part of the manual override to the brain if i'm using my eyes i can't be stressed we'll use the breath a lot of people don't realize that when we extend the out breath it slows the heart rate down and heart rate is a signal from the brain to speed up because we're running or fighting for our lives um we will do techniques to calm the nervous system which make people feel incredibly uncomfortable to start with and that can involve touching ourselves on our arms mm -hmm. but as i say to everybody if your mate was upset you'd pat him on the back you'd pat him on the arm we can do that for ourselves so for me preparation is sending a shed load of manual overrides to the brain to say you think there's a problem and there isn't so we come right into our environment, we tune in all of our senses, we know what we should be hearing if this is a crisis going on, we know what we should be seeing, oh look, we're not seeing any of it. That's for me preparation, it's it's putting out the fire before we then move into doing the, the things that are going to begin to transform our lives. In some cases, putting out the fire is, trans, is the transformation. You know, because we stop in that production of adrenaline and cortisol, and that's the problem. You know, that's that causes inflammation, and that causes, you know, ninety-five percent, according to research. And you're right, research is really important when you're dealing with with mental health. It causes ninety-five percent of all disease and illness. So let's put out the the production of cortisol and adrenaline. Let's stop that immediately. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the thing, isn't it? it, it it's a it's it's a healthy response when it's needed, but yeah. unfortunately, our our bodies and our brains evolve for a uh, a world that doesn't exist anymore. You know, yeah. the the, chan the chances of us kind of getting savaged by a, um, a you know a large jungle predator hopefully reasonably slim these days whereas you know those perceived jungle predators or or, or what are subconsciously unconsciously perceived to be uh, jungle predators these days unfortunately are, are things like our everyday lives are, are you know so when you have this prolonged exposure to a to a stressor which is unnatural then you end up having a slightly unhealthy iteration of that response so it is you know it's important yeah. to manage it but uh, that's not to um do down people who are feeling uh anxious they, 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 or, or undermine the validity of that feeling you know it's, it is a perfectly valid feeling it's just you know there are techniques that will help to deal with it to, so that you don't have to feel it all the time and that's that's the, the, the power of this stuff which i really like so uh, yes terrific stuff um you, you also mentioned self-talk I, I, I love one of the phrases you use in the book because, I, I, again, it's one of the little things that I noted. And I, I just had a wry smile to myself and thought, this is so true. You know, if you talk to other people the way that you talk to yourself, you wouldn't have any friends. Yeah. <laughs> That's so true. Because yeah. um, we, we, do, we do all kind of beat ourselves up. Why, why, why is that? Why, why do we have such a, um, a negative take on ourselves at times? We are defaulted towards the negative, and I always like to say that to people because, you know, we do need to know that. We are defaulted to, to think negatively. It is part of our survival response. But we know, um, the, we know, give me a child when he is seven and I'll show you the man. We know that the, the first things we learn up to those seven years are really important. We also know that the subconscious mind is actually the predominant mind up until we're about three. So mm -hmm. that cognitive rational brain that hasn't even be begun to develop in our in the first years so that self-talk can be an amalgamation it can and it can be a one-off thing it doesn't have to mean that somebody was consistently cruel to you but we know that these things are cumulative you know and if you get a parent who one day loses the temper and tells you you're stupid and then your teacher says the same thing and you know one of your friends laughs at you and says you are we know these things 
often start from nothing, not always. Sometimes mm. they've started from a bully, you know, be that a parent or a teacher or somebody at school. But often it can be something and nothing that that, that start that, that dialogue in our minds. And then we just carry on. We just take the voice on our payroll, which is always the sad thing for me. You know, people sometimes come to me and they talk to me about a bully, somebody somebody who was bullied, they were bullied at school and they're saying they've ruined my life. And then when I take them back and we think about how long ago they left school and actually they've not seen that person since and they've just taken the bully on the payroll. What a great phrase. Uh, that, that really does resonate. I, I think there's so many people I know who, who are in exactly that kind of boat. And it's uh, it's it's sad, isn't it, that we do these things to ourselves? But uh, it's, it's involuntary. I don't think every, anybody ever means to do it. Uh, oh, no. But uh, yeah, no, it's it's such a such a commonplace thing, isn't it? Um, it interesting, interesting. I, mean, I think um, self talk and and those sort of limiting beliefs that come from those things quite often, I mean, certainly in the work that I do, and I know you and I have worked together on on a few things. Uh, I, I see that that kind of self talk can be an impediment to taking action. And, and your emphasis on action within the book, I thought, was really, really powerful because it means that you can become the architect of your own life. And, and I mean, you've just quoted Aristotle. I'm going to quote somebody else and I can't even remember who the heck it was. So I can't remember. It might have been Franklin or it might have been Lincoln. It was one of those guys um, who said, you know, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. Uh, I suspect that probably is going to be Franklin because he was the inventor. But, you know, we'll, we'll whoever it was. It's a great quote. Yeah. Um, uh, attribution error but never mind um it, it's one of those things which you know if you can take action you can intentionally design your own future by taking action today you can also change your own mindset by taking action and and those outlooks of limitation can become outlooks of belief and, and positivity which is, is really something that comes through in the book so uh, yeah no that's great uh, i'm conscious we're coming believe it or not already to the the top of our half hour together and, and no. i did I know. I did say that half an hour was going to be uh, it was going to be tough to keep it down to half hour. So um, in, in terms of like a, just wrapping up a little bit, is there anything, any sort of key takeaways that you'd really like people to have uh, to know about from from the book or, or indeed from your work with them? That they're not broken, that they're not weak, that this is a physiological response that might be a bit oversensitive and that there is a lot of things that they can do that they don't have to feel there's a stigma at all um, because we can change and it's once we start it's really quite rapid fantastic powerful powerful words to finish on there um carol um how, how can people get hold of you um what's the best way for people to reach out and get in touch with you um you can get me on carol at carol you can phone me. Can I give my number out? Of course you can. <laughs> 07899 806 494. Yeah, please, please get in touch. I'm, I'm happy to share any knowledge that I have. There's no obligation on people. I, this is my uh, this is my mission. Absolutely fantastic. That's very good. And I know you work with um, uh, clients on an individual basis, but you also do some fantastic work with um, companies on, on an organisational level to be able to bring this kind of well-being to, uh, to to the workplace as well to assist employers with their duty of care to their employees. Um, so um, yes, if you are an employer and any of what we're talking about is resonating with you, um, or you feel that it may even be relevant to some members of your staff, but you don't even know how to broach that kind of a subject, then and uh, certainly do reach out to Carol and have a conversation with her. Um, so that's it for this week's Friday Live. My name's Matthew, Matthew Dashby Hughes, and it's been an absolute pleasure interviewing Carol this week. Um, next week, um, I have uh, my very good friend, Nikki Bartley, who has got some fabulous news about a um, uh, an incredible uh, innovation, which I cannot wait to share with you all. Um, but uh, if anybody in the meantime is wanting to get in touch with me, then obviously you can do so on LinkedIn. I'm the only Matthew Dashby Hughes on LinkedIn. There's not too many Dash Dashby Hughes around. Um, if you want to email me, then don't worry. You don't need to write that entire very, very long, stupid name. It's just mdh at sandler.com, just the initials. Keep things simple. Uh, and my... Um, uh, my, my, my mobile number is 07715269724. And that is it for this week's um, Friday Live. Hope you've enjoyed it. Hope you found some value in it. Um, and we will see you all again next week. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Matthew. Thanks, everybody. Cheers.